I am channeling my inner Candace Owens today by starting this video with a question. Do you think it is immoral to replace certain types of life insurance policies? And I'm specifically talking about a Lincoln Heritage policy. Now I'm going to back up for a second and I'm going to just briefly talk about why I'm channeling Candace Owens, why I'm referring to her. For those of you who don't know who she is, she is a conservative um, podcaster um, that is very controversial, that's very disruptive, that has very strong opinions about things. And I respect and gravitate towards people that challenge the status quo, that don't take information at face value, that want to take a step back and think for a second, do I have all the information that I need in order to make the best decision for myself or in this case for my customer? Now, I don't agree 100% with all of these strong views and opinions that Candace Owens has, but what I do respect and what I do like and what I want to do is disrupt the industry enough to the point where you question it where you take a step back and you start to think about the information you're being given, and maybe you should start thinking about it in a different way because I'm challenging you to think outside of the forefront of information you've been received up until this point. My question of the day of is it immoral to replace a Lincoln Heritage Life Insurance Policy might sound crazy, especially if you know nothing about the company, especially if all you know is we're expensive, right? And for those of you who don't know, my name is Dana. I represent Lincoln Heritage and I run a telesales team for them across 17 states. I have been in the business now for going on almost three years. I have personally sold almost a half a million dollars. My team has sold over $5 million. I think I've been in the business long enough to know that there are other options out there, right? There are lots of opportunities. There's lots of policies for our customers to choose from. And I don't live under a rock. I'm very well-versed on everything that's out there. And yet I still choose to stay where I am right now. I don't think the grass is greener. I happen to think that I'm actually putting my customer and their family in the best possible position every time they choose to move forward and buy a policy with us. Now let's take a big giant step back and I want you to think about something that's not related to life insurance. For those of you who love to eat meat, right? Because I'm not a huge meat eater, don't eat it very often. But for those of you that do, there are lots of documentaries. There are lots of videos that you can find exposing the cruelty of the meat and dairy industry and the factory farming and the conditions of the workers and the conditions of the animals and the poison that they insert into the livestock in order to mass produce meat to the United States and all over the world. So once information like that is exposed, once you have an inside look into the cruelty that takes place in the meat and dairy industry, you might it might not be enough for you to want to stop eating meat altogether, but it's possible that people watching this right now have taken the steps to now choose to buy organic, sustainable, family farmed, uh, humanly raised, free range, you know, fed, grass fed, not corn fed. You've made that choice for yourself because when you know better, when you know more information, you can make better choices. But also by making those decisions for yourself and your family, you're possibly paying two times, three times the amount of money that it would cost for you to just go down to your grocery store and buy a package of Tyson chicken but you don't. You choose to buy things that are better for the environment, that are better for you, and are better for the animals, and you pay a higher price for it. Let's unveil this curtain a little bit more. 
Do you have personal goals of money, of wealth, of where you want to be in your business? And what is the outcome of what the business is going to provide you? Is it going to be a nice car? Is it going to be a Rolls Royce? Is it going to be a Bentley? Are you going to be able to get Golden Goose sneakers or Air Jordans or um, Chanel bags? Why not just buy yourself a pair of Vans? Why not just drive a Toyota? Why not just live in a 1,000 square foot house? All you need is a roof over your head and a bathroom and a kitchen. Why do we strive for things that are better, even though they do the same exact thing? We do it because we see value in it. We see value in having the nicer homes, more space, more bedrooms, bigger backyards, safer community. We see value in the $900 shoes because we want people to have a perception about who we are. Or we see other people wearing expensive clothes, driving expensive cars, and society drives us to goals like that, taking the nice vacations, right? And you pay more because there's a perceived value there. So back to the immoral thing. Would it be immoral for you if you decided to stop eating the expensive beef? That if you just bought the Tyson meat or if you just bought the factory farm chicken, would that be immoral for you to make that decision just because you're saving money? I don't know. Only you can answer that. Let me ask you another question. And I want you to think about the answer to this question before you immediately just spew it out. Why did you get into the life insurance business in the first place? I originally chose the life insurance space because I was looking for a new career. I was looking to build a telesales team. I heard you could make a lot of money in life insurance. I came here because there was opportunity, probably for the same reasons that many of you got into it. But the longer that I'm in it, and the more that I learn, and the more the curtains have been unveiled to me, I have the ability now to make decisions based on what I feel is going to put my customer and their family in the best possible position. Yes, we are all here to make a great living. We are all here to have the nice cars, the nice vacations, the nice this, the nice that. But still, at the core of, of once you're in this business and you really understand the impact that we can have on families, there's a shift that happens. And when you feel that shift and that shift changes from just being a business owner to just making a bunch of money to just learning the right sales skills, and it shifts because you really feel morally obligated to make sure that you're putting your customer in the best position possible, now it's hard for you to go back, right? It's hard for you to go back and buy the the products that you know are causing harm to the environment, that are causing harm to the animals, that are causing harm to the workers. It's hard for you to go back. So I'm here to open your eyes and tell you why it would be immoral for you to look at someone who has a Lincoln Heritage policy and your first reaction is, oh boy, this is a lay down sale because I'm going to save them 10, 15, 20 dollars a month. I'm also going to make a few assumptions here. I'm going to assume that many people getting into the life insurance space right now are young. They're in their 20s, possibly. I know there's a lot that are a lot older than that, and they've been in the business for a long time, and you should actually know better. But for those of you who are just getting started and are younger and are not married and don't have children, I am telling you, your life will shift as you get older and as you start experiencing different parts of your life. And the people that we speak to are typically in their 60s, 70s, early 80s, and they have built a life with someone else. They have raised children 
They now have grandchildren. And unfortunately, they haven't done the best job at putting their families in a good financial position because when they pass, their families will most likely be left with nothing and have to struggle to come out of pocket and pay for funeral expenses. The majority of this world is not well off. They don't have the means to pay for a five, 10, 15, $20,000 funeral. I have been with my husband since 2004. We've been married since 2010. By the time we are in our 70s and 80s, we will have been together for 40, 50 years. Think about that for a second. If we're lucky enough to live that long, right? The moment after you've built an entire lifetime with someone that they leave this earth and you can no longer see them anymore, you can no longer touch them, you can no longer hold their hand, you can no longer complain to them or vent to them or eat with them, all of the things you've done every single day, multiple times a day for 30, 40, 50, 60 years is gone. The finality of that, do you really think anybody is going to be in the right state of mind to be able to handle what is about to happen next? And the answer is no, they will not. Even someone like me, who knows what happens in the funeral business, who understands life insurance, if that were to happen to me, I would be devastated. I would not be in the right state of mind. And to be able to have an advocate program to hold my hand and pick up those pieces for me so I don't have to do that would mean everything to me and my family. So I'm going to tell you a story of what happens when someone passes away, because I believe that if you understand what really goes on in the funeral industry, what really happens to these life insurance policies that you're selling, you might think twice about approaching someone that has a Lincoln Heritage policy and rubbing your greedy hands together and thinking that you're about to put your customer in a better position, you're about to make $1,000, but guess what? I'm going to challenge you to think twice. I want you to picture yourself in the hospital. And I want you to picture yourself there with someone that you care more about than anything else in the world, whoever that is for you. And you know that the end is coming. Things are not looking good. And the end finally arrives. And the nurse walks in two in the morning and taps you on the shoulder and lets you know that your loved one has just passed. You're going to be calling your family. You're going to be very upset. You're actually going to be devastated. It will feel like you have lost a limb because what we love on this earth means more to us than any thing that we could own. You cannot get that person back. No more than five minutes later, will that nurse come back into the room and ask you, what funeral home does she need to call for you? And if you don't know, she might hand you a list of funeral homes to call or to pick. She might leave the room, contact that funeral home for you because it's now time to make arrangements for that body because guess what? They have to make this room ready for the next patient. They need to transport this body no more than five minutes later. Minutes later, the nurse walks back in and says, you're gonna be getting a phone call from the funeral director from XYZ Funeral Home. So please you know, make sure you answer the phone when he calls. Sure enough, the phone rings, you answer the phone, it's the funeral director offering his condolences. I'm so sorry for your loss. Can you please come in tomorrow at 10 a.m. to talk about the next steps? And by the way, how do you plan on paying for this? Did your loved one have a life insurance policy? And if you do, and if you say yes, they're going to say, please do me a favor, bring the policy or policies with you so that we can make sure they're still in force. The next day, 
you and your family walk into the funeral home, you're greeted with water, coffee, tea, you're sitting down in the discussion room, talking about all the different options available to you, whether you want cremation or traditional burial. By the way, did you happen to bring that life insurance policy in with you today? Can I please take a look at it? You're going to hand that life insurance policy over to that funeral director, and he's going to give it to his uh, secretary so she can go in the back and make some calls and find out what they have to work with. And what they're going to say is they're going to say, we're going to make sure it's still in force. But as soon as that secretary leaves the room, she's just going to open that front page <laughs> and look for what? The face amount of the policy. If you had a $10,000 policy, if you had a $20,000 policy, guess what? Now they know how much they can spend. Let's pretend your loved one was going to have a traditional burial because you want to, and you want a viewing and you want a service and you talk about where the ceremony is going to be and the transportation from one place to the next. As soon as you're done, they are then going to take you into the casket showroom. And this is the most beautiful room in the funeral home. It's going to have museum lighting. It's going to have the most beautiful, most expensive caskets displayed in the middle of the floor that nobody ever buys. And it's designed in a way to get you to start looking at the most expensive so they can bring you down to a five or a $6,000 Batesville casket. Same exact five, $6,000 Batesville caskets are also displayed in ugly colors like dirt brown and army green that are listed for 1500 that nobody buys because they can't imagine seeing their loved ones in such an ugly casket. Little do they know that that same $1,500 casket can be ordered in the same exact colors as the beautiful ones that are displayed in the showroom. But you're grieving, right? You're not in the right state of mind. You're also going to be shown outer burial containers and you're going to be given information that you are hearing for the first time. You don't know what's required and what's not. You don't know what type of container is, is relevant or not. You're just relying on the funeral director to tell you what you need. And before you know it, that $20,000 policy you had is now gone. There's nothing left for you to have extra. In fact, sometimes they might even tell you it's a little bit more because now you only have to come up with a little bit out of pocket. But if we were to turn back the clock, if we were to have had a advocate program attached to our life insurance policy, through the Funeral Consumer Guardian Society, which is a nonprofit organization that works exclusively with Lincoln Heritage, who is founded by an ex-funeral director whose family has been in the funeral industry going back generations to the 1800s. They've seen the corporate takeover of the family-run funeral homes. They've seen the markup of the pricing. They've seen what they do to the consumers who bring them into the funeral homes and unknowingly sell them more than what they need. And they take advantage of the fact that they're grieving and they're not in the right state of mind. They take advantage of the fact that they know how much they can spend on a life insurance policy and the consumer has no idea. So with the Guardian Society program, what they do is they will send our clients a final wishes guide with their policy and some ID cards. And in that final wishes guide, our clients are gonna tell us ahead of time exactly what they wanna have happen when the time comes. They can be as detailed as they want, or they can just simply say they want a cremation and a small service. Whatever that is for our clients, they're going to send it back to us in a prepaid envelope. And we're going to store those final wishes with their policy information. So when we get the call from their family that they passed, guess what? Now we already know what to do. And the Guardian Society is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year to call the funeral homes at two o'clock in the morning, to pay bills on Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m., to sometimes even pay bills the very same day. That's right. 
because the Guardian Society doesn't even need a death certificate to pay out their claims. So what happens if the funeral home requires a 50% deposit up front and the family doesn't have the money? What happens then? Will the funeral home then try to get the family to assign that policy over to them? And what do you think happens now if that policy is 100% in their control? What do you think happens to the cost of that funeral now? So the moment these families call in to the Guardian Society and let them know that their loved one has passed, the Guardian Society will immediately contact the funeral home. By law, the funeral home has to provide all the information over the phone. It is not required that the family have to go in and sit through the sales process. It's their job to even shop two, three, four other funeral homes in the area, even a couple hundred miles away to make sure that anything they can save from this policy stays with the family. They will pay the funeral home for the cost of the negotiated service that day. They have paid in under an hour. <clears throat> and then what happens after the funeral services are paid for? Lincoln Heritage receives a death certificate. They do the claims process. They pay the family the remaining difference within 48 hours of that. And then the Guardian Society gets reimbursed. So I want you to sit back for a moment. We're just scratching the surface on the power of a funeral, funeral advocacy program and what they can do to really go the extra mile for these families. And so I'm gonna ask you this question again. If you know that someone has a policy with Lincoln Heritage and you're knowingly taking this benefit away from them, to be able to pay their families the same day, to be able to potentially save their family thousands of dollars on final expenses because you're going to save your client 10 or $15 a month. And it's not just about the cost of the funeral expenses, it's also about the peace of mind, knowing that on your worst day of your life, that you don't have to do any of the heavy lifting that you don't have to make those uncomfortable phone calls, that you don't have to sit in a sales room getting upsold on things that you don't need, that the Guardian Society will be there to take over, that they will be there to make sure that on the worst day of your life, that that money is paid out to your family right away, that they don't have to worry about getting overcharged or taken advantage of possibly by a, a corporate owned funeral home that by the way, still kept the family name so that you don't think it's a corporate funeral home. The point of this is that when you know better, you can do better. And that I don't leave Lincoln Heritage because I have made a shift. Yes, I am still in the business, to support my family, to build, a, to build a telesales team, to have all the things. But now that I know the power of lives that we can change and what we do, it's so much more than a policy. Why would I ever offer anything else? And I want you to take a step back and think about that for a second. What are you providing your clients? You're providing them with a life insurance policy, with money, with paper, that yes, will put their family in a better position, but how long will it take for that family to receive the money? Do you actually know? Do you just tell your families it's gonna take 24 to 48 hours? Because let me tell you something, it does not. Have you actually gone through the claims process? Do you know what it's like? Do you know that it can take four to six weeks? It can actually take up to six months or longer. And what type of position are you leaving your client's families in? If you set someone up with a policy because you saw your me monster come out and you saw an opportunity to put your clients in a better position by saving them 10, 15, $20 a month and to line your pocketbooks. Now, yes, on the other flip side of this, of course, I don't want our policies replaced. Of course, we don't want chargebacks. But ultimately, if I could sell 50 carriers, don't you think that I would? Why am I still here? Why have I not made the decision to leave and align myself with an IMO where I could get 120, 150% contract? 
where I could offer my clients policies that's basically just going to do nothing more than leave their family some money in an unknown time frame. The opportunity exists at a company that sells one product, one carrier, put their families in the best possible position when they pass away. And who am I choosing to align myself with? Because when you know better, you do better. When you understand what actually happens, you can make better decisions. So I'm gonna ask you the question one more time. Knowing what you know, and we've only just scratched the surface on what this guardian society can do for our families. Knowing what you know, is it immoral to replace a Lincoln Heritage policy because you're saving your client 10 or 15 or $20 a month, is it? Because I'll tell you right now, even if you do, they're not gonna take that 10 or 15, $20 a month and stick it into a bank account. It's gonna be spent. They didn't go 60 or 70 years of their life building up a savings account. So if they don't have a history of saving, they're certainly not going to do it now. So don't tell yourself that they're going to take that extra money and use it to pay for the extra costs or to, to keep extra money for their family because it's not going to happen. So challenge yourself. Think outside of the box. Think outside of what these large IMOs are feeding you. It's more than just a hundred and plus percent contract. It's more than just the cost of the policy. It is the result of what that policy is going to do for their family. And with volume and with opportunity, the money for the agent will be there. And in true Candace Owens spirit, that is all I have to say about that.